So both my parents are classical musicians. Um, my dad is a singer and a conductor and a pianist. And so he was often a collaborative pianist with amazing singers. And so I kind of grew up with all that wonderful harmony and texture on the piano and really top level singers coming in and out of the house singing. Yeah. And my mum is a violinist and she's a beautiful player, but focused more on teaching, especially she's especially good with little kids. Uh, makes it fun and so she made it fun for me and so I grew up playing piano, singing and playing violin which all three instruments informed all the others you know so it was really good. Yeah I remember I remember um, wearing a sort of pink frilly dress and playing a little piece called Dance Steps by Adam Cass. I could probably play it for you right now I still remember exactly how it goes not very difficult I don't know if it was very good. People say, oh, you started when you were three years old. Wow, how amazing. And they never stop to consider, I probably sounded pretty bad at three years old, always playing open string, something very basic. You know, so it's not like I was playing Tchaikovsky at three. No, it's nothing like that. Oh, come on. No, I know, I'm sorry to burst everyone's bubble, but you know, you gotta start somewhere. So as you grew up and you started to play more and more, um, you had a million different influences, I'm sure, but was there a violinist or two that just just stole your heart? Yeah, I think early on it was mostly David Oistrakh. So that beautiful, open, resonant, warm, genuine, uncomplicated, not egotistical kind of sound that he had. And it was straight from the heart. And um, my mum was a big fan of David Oistrakh, so she had all his records, all the LPs. And uh, yeah, so that's what I listened to. And Itzhak Perlman as well, as a child. And I remember listening to his recording of Vivaldi's Four Seasons, the perennial favorite. And I remember saying to my mum about when I was maybe 10 or 11, I was playing one of the movements from Winter. And I remember saying, I want to play just as well as Itzhak Perlman. And you know what she said to me? She said, I bet you can. You know, just, just to be able to instill that belief in a child who has, exhibits some ta talent and clearly wants to do it. I just, I'm so grateful for that upbringing where I, I've always believed I could do anything I wanted to if I just worked hard enough. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, to be honest, it's part of my job to make sure that every piece I play in public resonates with me in some way, because if it doesn't, then I'm going to do a boring or flat performance and then the audience isn't going to get what they came for. So I've definitely worked hard at the pieces which perhaps don't naturally resonate with me or I don't naturally gravitate towards. I've worked hard at understanding the value of those pieces and listening to more interpretations, getting more historical context, figuring out what was going on, why was it special, why do people like it? And that's helped a lot. Getting older also helps because you go, wow, I really didn't like that in my 20s and now I really like it. I understand it more because your brain grows. So I think I've grown up a bit, only a bit. Um, but there are definitely some pieces that I think every music student who pursues it in some sort of semi-serious way finds pieces that they hear on the radio or on a CD or, or on Spotify and they go, oh, I want to play that. I love that. That just, I have to play that. And of course, throughout my life, I've had those pieces where you listen to it and you just go, maybe one day, maybe one day I'll be good enough to have a go at that piece. Yeah, yeah. but there's loads of them. You know, I couldn't even, if you asked me to name some, you'd be here all day. That would be the end of the interview. So. Uh, pull that off. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, if you can pull it off, I reckon you should feel pretty joyful. Um, some of the Paganini stuff is really insane, but some of it for an advanced violinist, it's, it's just extra technique. And most people, if they, it, once you're at a certain level, you can practice those, those double stops or those certain bow techniques. Uh, it's not easy and requires a lot of work, but not everything by Paganini is completely impossible. And I don't think any of it's actually impossible, which is so frustrating. Because imagine you could just say, oh, it's impossible, and then you wouldn't even have to try. But because it's actually manageable, that's why we still try. It's been great. So first of all, I'm really happy to be here. I was a bit of a last minute replacement in a number of ways. So a friend got in touch and asked if I wanted to do it. And miraculously, I managed to work it out with my work 
back in Australia and my family and the travel arrangements. And so, you know, sometimes you get a random email or phone call and a, an opportunity comes up and you just go, yeah, I can make that work. And then when it actually works, you, you feel like some sort of little miracles happen. So I was getting on the plane and I was landing and I was getting here at the cultural center and I'm just going, I'm actually here. And all the random sets of circumstances that happened to bring me here, it's just astonishing to think about, but that's life, right? It's just a bunch of coincidences or a bunch of events that happen in sequence. Yeah. So yeah, it's wonderful to be here. It's a rich and vibrant place. There's so much going on. It's a little bit chaotic. There's a lot to absorb. There's a lot of new people to meet, a lot of new repertoire to learn. I mean, not only that, I have to uphold myself to the highest standards so I can be inspiring to audiences and the apprentices. And then apprentices are asking me questions. And so I'm always thinking, right, how can I help? How can I help them in that, that stage of their career? You know, it's great. It's really, um, it's very nourishing. It's very enriching. Fulfilling. That's a, that's a better word, yeah. So it, it's the best orchestra you might never have heard of, right? Because of course we're on a tiny little island right in southern Australia, in the, at the south of Australia. So we're about 42 degrees south in Hobart, which is where the symphony is based, but we tour all around the state. The state of Tasmania, the island of Tasmania, is about geographically the size of Ireland, um, but the population's about half a million. So there's a lot of wilderness in there. Anyway, um, I had a wonderful career in America before that, and I had a wonderful job in Seattle, um, but I was associate concertmaster. Now associate concertmaster sits um, next to the concertmaster. So oftentimes I was sitting there and then I was sitting as concertmaster. So it's like two jobs in one, which is great for flexibility and, and learning the repertoire and being under pressure. And then I had kids and I thought, you know, I really want to do one job because I'm very much an all in sort of person. And I thought if I had one job and it was a concertmaster job, I could put all of my energy into being that person, not, not just doing the job, but being a concertmaster. So I said to my husband, he tells me this and I don't remember this, but he said we landed in Seattle and apparently I said, right, we'll have two kids and then I'll get a concertmaster job. So I applied for the first concertmaster job that came, off, came up on the website that lists all the classical music jobs um, was the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra. And I was actually pregnant with the second kid. So by the time I did my interview with them, I just had my second kid. And when I did my little trial with them, my youngest was six months old. So I guess I wasn't kidding when I said, right, we'll have two kids and then I'll get a concertmaster job. It just happened so fast. And it was the first, first one up out of the gate. So I'll go for that. Had you been to Tasmania before? No. It's beautiful. It's, yeah. I've seen it extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's stunning. It's like no other place on earth. It's... Um, it feeds my soul with the nature that it has. Beautiful waterways, temperate rainforest on the west coast, and a lot of great mountains. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's a fabulous place to live. So it was a random sort of, you know, shot in the dark. Um, but also it's a chamber orchestra. Now there's not that many professional full-time chamber orchestras in the world. Most orchestras are big symphony orchestras. And I like the smaller repertoire. And I like having a small string section, for instance, where we can really become a team. And that's what sometimes I found to be missing in the bigger sections. It's like you're just a sea of players. It becomes every person for themselves at a certain point. But in our orchestra, we can really get that team sound, that team spirit. And that's very special and very rare. So my job's quite unique. That's really interesting. Yeah. That's something I had no idea about. Yeah. Um, off the record, and I won't record this part, but how's, how are things going with, with this group? I mean, are you, are you feeling a sense of unity? And, yeah, and, uh, yeah. But I mean, also, we have two weeks of work, work, you know, projects, whatever you want to call it. And first day is, is chaos, because we don't know the person we're sitting next to. And a lot of these people haven't played the repertoire before. Some of the conductors, the, the student conductors, haven't conducted the repertoire before. And we're all expected to come together as a sort of conce uh, cohesive whole. Uh, it's definitely not like that on the first day. So that's a bit confronting, but that's normal. That's very normal, especially for summer festivals and things. 
by the end of the week, the amount of progress that's made with personal connections, musical ideas, cohesion, communication between the podium and the players is stratospheric. And you see, that's, that's great for us as mentors, but for the apprentices, it must feel really good. They must feel kind of lost at the beginning. And by the time they get on stage and play a Mahler symphony, they're like, wow, look at what I just did. At least I hope they feel that way. I would if I were them. It's interesting sitting in an orchestra. So for instance, if you're sitting in an orchestra that you're employed with, you're working with a lot of the same people all the time, right? So the big difference is who's standing on the podium every week. Um, and so it's interesting how different everyone is. Like Richard is very different from Brittany, for instance, who's very different from, I think his name's Alex. Um, Alex has a really visceral kind of energy, right? He, his feet. he does, yeah. he does. So, I mean, this is only rehearsal, so I'm a little bit nervous about what he's gonna do okay. in performance. Just get ready, you know, that it could be unexpected. And yeah. it's amazing because you sort of, you might think, someone who doesn't know much about classical music might think that conducting is really easy, right? Because you just, you put one, beat one, beat two, beat three, beat four, and then learn all the other beat patterns, learn a score, you know, stop, go. I mean, it's really, right? Seems pretty simple, but no, you have to have some kind of magic, especially when you're working with a bunch of seasoned professionals who are like, all right, Beethoven five again, what have you got? You know, and sometimes, I mean, I remember Kurt Mazur, who's passed away now, but he was one of the great conductors of an, of an older generation. He came to Seattle to do Bruckner's Fourth Symphony, which is a beautiful big cathedral of a symphony. Mm -hmm. And he, he was very old and, you know, reasonably middle stages of some kind of Parkinson's where things are shaking, right? Didn't talk much. And so you're sort of going, is this, is this gonna, is he gonna be okay? And you have to begin with incredibly quiet tremolo. Tremolo is where you're sort of shivering on the string in the strings. And it's, it's just the strings. And you've got to begin together, yet imperceptibly, very quietly, but all together, right? So it's hard. You wouldn't want to do this because it's not the right character. And I'm kind of going, what is he gonna do? And he just does this. He's, his hands are there and they're shaking because he has some kind of Parkinson's, I'm assuming, and yet, because of his charisma and he like just mind, you know, he could mind read all of us. We all came in at exactly the same time with the perfect color and he never had to rehearse it. Wow. And I'll never forget it. And that's because he had the magic.